Joining us now on the panel, the new CEO of the United States Studies Centre at the University of Sydney, Dr Bates Gill. Dr Gill, welcome to you. Thank you. Can we look a little bit forward after having gone over what happened today for a while and, and look at potentially what this means for the United States and its place in the world? There have been opinion polls that have said that more than 60% of Australians supported Barack Obama. I think Mitt Romney romped home with 9% of support. Partly name recognition, but we do tend to favour Democrats. Is this good for the Australia-US alliance, having a Democrat in the White House? I wouldn't characterise it so much as a Republican or a Democrat. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine that had Romney won, that he would in some way reverse what is a clear effort on the part of the United States to deepen relationships out here, seeing Australia as a key partner. Um, I, I suppose the one upside of having Mr. Obama back in office again, as, as regards the foreign policy question Australia, is that he's already committed to this. Clearly, the, the whole effort to, to do the pivot, to do the rebouncing <coughs> out here is in motion. Resources are being put forward. He's made his visit here to Australia and elsewhere. So in that sense, he's already far along this curve. Uh, and, he's, and he's a person that's well known here and someone that's already understood the devil you know rather than the devil you don't. Do you think Australians would have been less comfortable with the idea of US Marines permanently stationed in Darwin under President Romney? I don't think it would have made that much difference at all. I mean, we're well aware that as far as foreign policies are concerned, most Americans aren't paying all that much attention. Really. We also became aware throughout the campaign that there wasn't a substantial difference between the two candidates on foreign policy, a difference in tone which of course is important in, in diplomacy to be sure. Uh, but as for the way the world will perceive this victory from Barack Obama, is this an endorsement of the Obama doctrine, the build coalitions uh, to, uh, to carry a big stick but you know, maybe hide it behind your back sometimes as well? I'm quite sure that there are uh potential enemies of the United States uh, that may be uh, relieved in a sense uh, who would see in an Obama presidency going forward restraint, uh, uh, maybe a clearer understanding about the, um, the constraints that are going to have to exist for American foreign policy and power projection going forward. Um, but, but by and large, uh, you know, I don't think we would have seen a big difference one way or the other had it been uh, Romney uh, or, 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 or Obama uh, handling the foreign policy issues. This is also a week of, of transition in China, an important relationship for Australia and the United States both. Do you think they are comfortable with uh, another four years of, of Barack Obama and the way that that relationship is looking? Uh, probably. I think by and large, um, again, they're probably more comfortable with an entity that they know about. But uh, more broadly, um, the U.S.-China relationship at the moment, um, I think, is at one of its worst points in terms of mutual trust across this relationship that it's been for some time, probably 15 to 20 years, uh, in part because President Obama has taken steps to be a little bit more uh, firm uh, with China across a range of questions. So they're probably not unhappy about uh, uh, Mr. Obama being returned, but at the same time, uh, the smart ones in Beijing, as well as in Washington, know that there's going to be a tough road ahead for this relationship. What would they have thought of a President Mitt Romney who was saying, trade war, bring it on? Well, clearly they were very unhappy about the, some of the rhetoric that came out of uh, uh, the candidate Romney. Um, who knows what he would have actually done had he come into office. I think he would have recognized very quickly the, the real constraints upon him uh, in the relationship with, with China. But what really struck me as interesting in, in looking at the two candidates as they approached the foreign policy issues, President Obama, I think, did say a lot more and has, and has been a lot more effective in delivering to the American people the need to look to Asia Pacific as, as the future. Didn't hear a lot of that coming out of the Romney campaign, which surprised me. Alexander Dan, I want to bring you in here. What did you make of, of Bates's uh, comment that he thinks that maybe the U.S.-China relationship is at a low ebb, may, may, maybe as bad as it's been in, in 20 years? Do you uh, see it that way? I'm not sure that it's, uh, it's so bad. I think there is a kind of mutual understanding. There's a recognition that they're both entirely dependent on each other. Um, I've often said that this is the most important bilateral relationship in the world and for Australia um, there's no, I mean the American alliance is a, is a given uh, there's nothing more important um, than that relationship being properly managed but admittedly by both sides not just by the United States I think President Obama has on the whole managed it pretty well um, I don't think it would have made a huge difference if Romney had become the uh, president. I can speak, though, from a point of view of an incumbent government. Usually, um, it suits you to have uh, the incumbent re-elected because it's, you've, you know all the people 
um, and and you don't have to make new friends and and make new explanations and try to create new policies if the incumbent is re-elected. So I think in Beijing they'll think, well, we know where Obama's coming from, uh, we know what his policies are. There's a consistency here, a change. Well, there would have been uncertainty. Um, and for the Australian government, well, they'll be relaxed about this as well because um, the personnel will go on. It's not so much an ideological issue. I don't think there's much in that. But I think it's just more the consistency of personnel and of policies. That, uh, um, And if you take the world as a whole, I mean, I saw polls taken in 32 countries. In 31 of those countries around the world, they wanted Obama to be re-elected in one they wanted Romney to win. And that one was quite an important country. That one country was Israel. Well, let, well let's talk about that region now. Batesgill, uh, one of the, the differences, certainly in tone, and maybe it was just campaign rhetoric, but Mitt Romney said, if Barack Obama's re-elected, Iran will get a nuclear bomb. Vote for me as a result. How do you think this news today is being received in Tehran? I think the Obama administration has been pretty tough on Iran and has done everything it could to mobilize a strong coalition, which has indeed put a real squeeze uh, on, on Iran. Um, all the intelligence information that is public, at least, uh, and disclosed uh, to those like us, uh, suggests that uh, Iran is not, at the moment, pursuing a weaponization uh, of its nuclear uh, uh, efforts. Uh, that might be in part a uh, recognition that to do so would be real disaster for them. Uh, and we know also that as a part of this uh, pretty persistent effort to squeeze Iran, there have been real setbacks in that program. Um, so I can't think that Iran would actually be pleased necessarily with the outcome. There's going to be a very tough slog for them, for the United States, uh, and the whole region in trying to get this down, this thing to a, to a, to a point that's more uh, resolved. One of the things that second-term American presidents uh, toy with, knowing it's a third rail, but they just got to try and touch it, certainly Bill Clinton in his dying days of his second term, wanted to see what he could do about the Israel-Palestinian situation. George W. Bush didn't necessarily want to touch it, but he moved in that direction. What do you think Barack Obama might do there in the next four years? Well, I think um, the president has had some uh, problems, you know, in, in creating some trust uh, and a stronger relationship with the Israeli government as it, as it stands now. Um, it's still going to be tough to try and uh, reach out again and, and rebuild that kind of trust. Um, I don't see coming forward any bold initiative coming out of Washington from, uh, from this president. Uh, not so much that he doesn't want to see it happen. Uh, all Americans would, I would think, like to. But there are just enormous other challenges and serious restraints on, on any government, whether it was uh, Obama or Romney, going forward on the foreign policy sphere. Bates Gill, stay with us for a minute. One of the key themes of this U.S. presidential election year has been the increasing polarization in American politics. And some of today's results will ensure that that great divide just continues. In Massachusetts, moderate Republican Senator Scott Brown has been defeated by high-profile Democrat Elizabeth Warren. Another less partisan Republican, uh, Olympia Snow, up in Maine, she didn't compete. And Indiana's Richard Luger, who was not necessarily a moderate, but he, uh, he worked in a bipartisan fashion. He's out of politics after this election, after losing his primary to a Tea Party Republican. Christina Keneally, first to you on this. Given mm. that it seems that, that that hole at the heart of American politics just got a little bit bigger, one less Republican moderate there. What hopes are there for Barack Obama to build the kind of coalitions needed to get anything done in these next four years? Well, first of all, with Richard Luger, I don't know if I'd read that interpretation. Richard Luger kind of failed to live in Indiana for a period <laughs> of time, a long period of time, and had some issues around that, uh, and frankly probably had outstayed his welcome there. Uh, but uh, you're right, and I think uh, Alexander referred to this earlier, the, the looming fiscal cliff issue, uh, the looming uh, divide that continues, looming issue there, but the divide that continues with the Senate and the House of Representatives is going to be a big challenge. It's worth remembering that uh, probably the most unpopular institution in America right now is Congress, and so we saw a weird dynamic at play here that Probably, I don't know the statistic at the moment, but the vast majority of incumbents More were... More than 95% re-elected. Re-elected, <laughs> <laughs> even though Congress has something like a 9% approval rating. So there's that weird dynamic of people will re-elect their own local member, uh, but 
you know, think the whole institution and is 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 you know woeful, and certainly the fiscal cliff issue uh, is part of that. And I, you know, I do think that Obama hasn't really got a solution to that. At least he hasn't articulated one, uh, and that's going to be a real the real test, I think, of his next year. We'll have a, a little more on that fiscal cliff issue shortly, Alexander Downer. In a lot of your dealings in Washington D.C., I guess in your in your foreign affairs portfolio, you were sort of floating slightly above the political fray. But did you find that it was it was impossible to escape? partisanship that these these animals in on Capitol Hill they are just political beasts yes they are I mean I, I, I say during my sort of adult lifetime um, the US Congress has become substantially more partisan and I don't blame one party over the other I think they both have, on occasions have behaved abominably I think the way the Republicans dealt with President Clinton and in, in impeaching him and that confrontation was pretty ugly the way the Democrats dealt with President Bush and uh, challenged his legitimacy did everything they could to frustrate his presidency was pretty woeful um, and I um, was the foreign minister during all of this period and uh, then of course I can see Republicans causing problems for President Obama. I mean I do have a criticism of President Obama. He had two years when he had everything in his hands. The Democrats controlled both houses so he can't complain and honestly he didn't use those first two years. Now he has got one month, just over one month, one and a half months, um, to um, put together a budgetary package with the Republicans and he has to do it. It has to be done. So there's no point in him any longer taking a partisan view. He, having been re-elected, has to rise above partisanship and take a lead. He actually has been, in my view, quite a partisan president and he has to rise above that now. We'll pick up that line of thought with Nick uh, Bryant in just a moment. But first, to Anthony Green, let's get an update on how the Congress is looking, how these other races other than the presidential race have panned out today. Anthony. Well, we'll just do the presidential figures again first off. 303 to 206. As far as I can gather, nobody's prepared to, uh, to call Florida. The counting's all complete except for what they haven't counted yet and it's a little unclear to know what's going on there. If you look at the overall figure that's occurring, we've got 87% of pre-6 across the country. It's 49.8 for the Democrats, 48.7 for Mitt Romney. And uh, we'll have a quick look at Florida just to see what those numbers look like at the end of the night. It's, uh, I think it's 50% for Obama. 49.2 for Romney. So um, I, I don't know the numbers of what's to come well enough, but it's about 1% precincts to be counted. And we look at the Congress, the House of Representatives, it looks like the numbers are more or less exactly the same as they were, 240 to 194, with one seat still in doubt. Um, it's an extremely partisan way they draw electoral boundaries in many states of the United States, which makes it very unusual to, uh, to lose seats, to, to, to have a big swing unless um, a number, you often see big swings at midterm elections, but it does seem to be you don't get a lot of change at general elections at the presidential years. And when we look at the Senate, um, we've seen no, no change there. Um, two thirds of the Senate stays in place. Um, 33 members were elected today. It's 53 Democrats, 45 Republicans and two others, and those two others both lean heavily towards the Democrats. Um, now that might look like to an Australian eye that the Senators uh, the Democrats control the Senate, but the way the Senate works in America is you must have minority support for legislation and 40 members on the opposition is enough to uh, put in a filibuster which delays the passage of legislation. So um, the position is still there for exactly the same sort of deadlock in Congress. The House is controlled by the Republicans. The Senate looks like it's controlled by the Democrats, but the Republicans have a blocking minority in the Senate. And then we have a president now, and um, as we've seen in the past at many previous elections, a second-term president in some ways almost ends up a lame duck as soon as, soon as he's elected because his own party, sometimes some of the senior figures in his own party are already planning for them to run next time. So uh, there's a lot of dynamics to go on within the Republican Party, on the future of the Democratic Party, and also the battles within the Congress. Anthony Green, thank you very much for your analysis. So, Nick Bryant, Barack Obama has secured a second four-year term, but, as Anthony says, that duck starts, starts limping pretty quickly these days, with the filibuster in the Senate having been used more in the last session of Congress than before. What hope has he of overcoming that and getting things done? Well, this is the huge problem for Barack Obama, because whatever he says about the red states and blue states and the United States of America, Washington politics is rendered in far deeper shades of blue and red now. There used to be considerable overlap between moderate Republicans and conservative Democrats. For only the second time, the National Journal, when they looked at the voting records now of Congress, they found virtually no overlap at all. Uh, Congress relies on bipartisanship, but it's been replaced by 
brinksmanship, as we've seen in the debt crisis. Uh, you really need to be able to reach across the arc. But the minority leader in the Senate, Mitch Connell, has said his deter he was determined to limit Barack Obama to one term in office. We'll see what he does now. But checks and balances that were all a part of the Constitution have become vetoes and roadblocks. And as Alexander says, it's a, a problem on both sides of politics at the moment. And it's almost brought Washington to the point of ungovernability. I mean, Washington not only stands now in the way of presidential greatness, it stands in the way of basic good governance, as we've seen through the handling of the debt crisis. Batesgill, this is something that we, we have heard for years now, certainly since the 1990s. Washington is broken. It doesn't work. Is it working, or does it need to be reformed, or simply do we just have to have people of goodwill uh, try and find a way through this mess? It's definitely broken. Um, I don't see any... Uh force that is going to arise that's going to somehow be able to bring about the kinds of reform or change. These are long-standing traditions and, and, and situations that have been there for a while. Um, I don't see big change. Um, the, it's going to be slow unfolding. One interesting thing I thought coming out of the most recent round of elections, however, we could say, maybe begin to argue that certainly the House, on the House side, with the smaller districts, with the gerrymandered districts that basically assure a seat, that's going to remain probably in Republican hands for some time. I don't see that changing, certainly not over the course of Obama's uh, administration. But interestingly, uh, conservative states, Indiana, Missouri, where Romney led the, led the ballot and won, couldn't carry the full ballot forward because extremely conservative candidates for Senate for a wider uh, constituency were unable to win. So, if nothing else, this election may have seen off the Tea Party, if not get a lot else done. We, in Washington, I don't think we've heard the last of the Tea Party, but, 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 no, but, but I think I think there again is going to be some deep soul searching about the value of their contribution to, to winning. Bates CEO of the U.S. Study Center, thanks very much for thank joining you. us. Nick Bryant, former Washington correspondent at the BBC, thank you very much indeed. Alexander Downer, former Foreign Minister, great to have you with us. And Christina Keneally, former New South Wales Premier, thank you as well.